Merhabalar, hepiniz tekrar hoş geldiniz. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody and before we get started today, um, I wanted to just uh, send another thank you to uh, Kurt Kayak. And I think, Denise, you're going to say a few words, right, to start us off before I... Okay. As we always emphasize, this is funded by Support Program for Human Rights, and also this program would be recorded and will be shared via YouTube later on. And please turn your mics off if you will not take the follow, and please start your camera. And now I would like to give the floor to Kim. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to thank Kirkayak again for organizing the seminar series and again for the super team, all the work that you do and all of your hospitality. And I wanted to thank also Ahmet, um, Be Ahmet Bey to just thank you again for all the translation work that you're doing. Um, I know I really have benefited from it and um, you're doing an excellent job. So thank you so much for that. And um, I just wanted to also extend again a recognition to, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Steele, um, but to all of our guests who are making time to join us and um, share their knowledge with us for the seminar series, and to all of you for making time this evening to join us. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maurice Steele, who's going to be uh, speaking on border deaths today. Um, and um, Dr. Steril is a good friend and colleague, and uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome him here. And um, you know, I consider him as doing some of the uh, most cutting edge work in the field of critical migration and refugee studies. So it's really a privilege. Um, Dr. Maurice Steril is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Warwick. For this, he was holding a position as assistant professor in comparative border studies at the University of California in Davis. His research focuses on migration struggles in contemporary Europe and Northern Africa, and particularly looking at emerging forms of uh, border governance in the Mediterranean Sea, and looking at a lot around um, sort of humanitarian rescue logics on the one hand, and migrant deterrence, and then also forms of um, resistance to these border controls. The new book out, which is called Migrant Resistance in Contemporary Europe, it was published in 2019 by Rutledge. And this again looks at European border governance and resistance through public protests by migrant activists and also um, protests, maybe some of the less visible kind of forms of protest or resistance through irregular uh, migration and subverting borders as well as looking at forms of uh, newly forms of emerging solidarities and communities that arise, uh, particularly around the fight for freedom of movement. He has been published in uh, many journals, but to name but a few, um, Globalizations, um, EPC, Politics in Space, International Political Sociology, South Atlantic Quarterly, Citizenship Studies, Global Society and elsewhere. And he regularly contributes to many open um, public forums. So if you uh, go to Open Democracy, for example, you'll see many of his pieces uh, authored there. He also contributes to The Conversation, which is another um, open forum, and regularly to uh, media sources such as Al Jazeera and The Guardian. He's a member of the editorial team of the Journal of Citizenship Studies, and he's a member of the activist project Watch the Med Alarm Phone. And so it's really uh, a privilege to have um, Dr. Steele here today. And um, Maurice, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much for making time for us. Thanks, Kim and Faisy and everyone else who invited me to speak. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I will try to put on my slides. Um, let me know if it doesn't work. Um, where do I? Yeah, can you see it okay? Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as Kim just said, um, I 
base quite a bit of my own research um, also on practical engagement, um, especially in the network called Alarmfone. I'll speak about this uh, in a bit. Um, but I think, you know, when we speak about migrant death, you know, for me, this has become quite a sort of intimate and, you know, awful relationship with that, you know, uh, in the way in which we've tried to support people who are actually trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea on precarious boats. So the network in which I engage has uh, supported about three and a half thousand uh, boats uh, over the last seven years. And of course, in doing so, you know, we've also experienced how many people have lost their lives or disappeared uh, along Europe's maritime borders. And so today, you know, with this sort of um, topic at hand, you know, I will focus on the Mediterranean region, but I think it has also, you know, much greater significance about in terms of how, how Europe tries to um, um, deter people on the move and organize its sort of border system. Um, I suppose that for you um, and for many here, migration across this sort of Mediterranean space is nothing really new, right? I mean, we hear about migrant crossings and migrant deaths, you know, in, in newspapers and articles nearly every day. Um, and also just this weekend, when we look at the island of Lampedusa, for example, over 2000 people have arrived just over two days, um, while also many have lost their lives. Just yesterday, at least 24 people have disappeared uh, off the coast of Libya. So over the last 10 years or so, more than 22,000 people are believed to have died in the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, this number is so high that it is difficult to comprehend, right? And also it is mostly a mere guess because you know, we have a very sort of flawed way in which we try to count people who are drowning because most of all, European authorities are not very interesting, interested in accounting for those who go missing. So very little is actually done to identify them. So when we think about migrant death at sea, many see it as a sort of quasi natural um, phenomenon, right? Something that just seems to happen and happen uh, again. But you know what I want to argue today is that this is of course not the case. You know, a few decades ago, it was also very rare to see anyone cross the Mediterranean on these small wooden or plastic boats. And, you know, very few people actually died. So what has happened since? And in order to find the answer for migrant death in the sea, I think we need to look at the interplay between human movements, migration policies, and border enforcement strategies um, that have uh, materialized over the last decades. I want to start first. Oh. What's going on? <laughs> Okay, sorry, this just seems to play something automatic. Can you hear that? Could you control uh, the no. slide now? There's a, there used to be a, um, an arrow. Can you see the arrows on the right, left, center, um, uh, Maurice, to change the slides? No. And your keyboard now? doesn't. Yeah. Can you see yeah. the slides now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I leave it now like this, and then because I think there is some uh, added vo sound to these slides. <laughs> so oh, when I go, it plays my oh. own voice, which is really confusing. Uh, okay. I'll do it like this, and then later I open it up full screen again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Maurice, do you want the sound to show? To, to no, play? this was a, okay. yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, I want to just start first with a sort of definition of migration policies, right? Migration policies as defined here by De Haas and others are described as rules, so law national states and act with the explicit objective of affecting the volume, uh, the direction, uh, and composition of migration, right? I think, you know, when we think critically about migration policies, we have to think a bit more broadly and also to consider other actors that are involved in creating these regulations and measures, right? So think about international organizations such as the UNHCR, IOM, and of course, in the European context, also the EU, and in particular, also the EU border agency Frontex which works, of course, in the name of protecting European borders. So migration policies as rules designed and enacted by states and other actors to, for example, increase or decrease immigration or a particular kind of migration from a particular place means that you know, migration is, of course, impacted by a lot of policy decision and political processes. Quite often when we hear about how migration policies are designed, it seems as if you know, there was the belief that migration could be steered in very particular ways, right? So sometimes quite often politicians regard migration policies as in terms of a sort of water tap, right? So if you need particular human skills or resources, you know, they pretend that they can turn it on and then migrant workers come and then they can again turn it off and migration stops or they remove those who are sort of coming in um, unnecessarily in a way, right? So for example, think about um, how Spain, you know, needs migrant workers in the agriculture sectors. Um, they, the Spanish government may design certain visa policies that allow certain workers from Morocco or elsewhere or Tunisia to come for some time. And then the idea is that they quite often leave again when the job is done. And of course, it does not work in this way. Um, you know, also think about the Turkish guest workers uh, who came to Germany. And the idea was that they would leave again after sort of the job was done, right? But of course, many have built a life in Germany. And, you know, I live in Berlin. Many in this area also where I live have uh, built a new home, started a family, and have become part of the society, right? This means that migration policies are not often um, able to do what they are designed to do, right? And migration policies have also produced a range of sort of side effects. And this can, of course, be seen particularly or in a particularly devastating way also in the Mediterranean Sea. In order to understand irregular migration across the sea, we have to also understand its particular history, right? Which is directly linked to other important political uh, um, processes, including processes of Europeanization, the you know, global financial crises, wars and conflicts, and so on. We have to understand that although maritime migration uh, you know, features in the media nonstop, um, it constitutes overall a very tiny proportion of migration. Right? So you can see this in this slide. When we look at the total of displaced populations in the world, nearly 80 million in 2019, 85% of the displaced are hosted in neighboring countries. Um, so only one of these top five countries was in Europe. And so when we explore Mediterranean migration today and migrant death at sea, we need to keep this sort of figure in mind because migration across the sea is often portrayed as a sort of invasion, right? Where for some reason it is turned into a sort of wave or even a migrant tsunami. Okay, so just a few brief comments about the sort of history of Mediterranean migration to Europe. 
sea migration became a phenomenon only in the 1970s, so now maybe about 50 years ago. Um, it was the 1973 oil crisis which led to a um, hike in unemployment in several Western European countries. And this hike in unemployment led to restrictions on labor migration. Before these restrictions, people from North Africa and Turkey would travel quite easily you know, on planes and ferries to Europe to work. But then these new restrictions and restrictive migration policies came in and they created a new sort of industry, right? Where people sought other irregular ways of reaching Europe. And so migration across the sea was in many ways the effect of restrictive migration policies, right? So with European or Western European uh, governments trying to sort of turn down or close this water tap, right? It did not really work. Actually, it prompted other forms of irregular migration. In the 1980s and 1990s and afterwards, you know, sea migration became quite common, especially when the EU began to consolidate an area of freedom of mobility within the Union while, exacerbate, or while reinforcing its external borders, right? And again, these rounds of restrictions prompted um, uh, more sort of irregularized migrations from the global south. Then in the 2000s, and also in response to many border crossings, we saw the introduction of, again, new policies. Those policies tried to turn Europe, Europe's borders into a communalized project, right? So we saw a communalized border surveilling system emerge and Frontex, uh, you know, the European border agency started in the mid 2000s. And then we also saw how EU member states con concluded a range of bilateral agreements with uh, countries in Northern Africa, Libya, Tunisia, and Morocco in particular in order to regulate migration. So suddenly leaving one's country, so, uh, you know, trying to cross the sea became criminalized uh, even more. And at the same time, we see how European authorities are very willing to hand over um, the enforcement of borders to these third countries, right? So this is something that is sometimes referred to as the externalization of borders. So that, you know, Tunisia, Morocco, um, Libya, and so on, basically, you know, stop migration, or at least uh, try to prevent uh, migrant crossings on behalf of Europe. And so in this sense, you know, other states and other governments are turning into Europe's sort of frontier guards. And so, you know, even if these policy measures and restrictions decreased migration across the sea maybe for a couple of years, they were never able to fully stop it, right? And there were again so many uh, political processes involved that reconfigured, especially the, uh, you know, the situation in Northern Africa and uh, the Middle East that, you know, there were new uh, migration corridors that emerged and of course also the need to um, use the services of smugglers, right? So it's now 10 years ago that the Arab uprisings uh, started in North Africa, um, which led to the crumbling of many authoritarian regimes, right? Including the ones in Tunisia and in Libya. So when Ben Ali and Gaddafi fell, this also meant that some of these European, externalized European frontier guards fell. And 10 years ago, then we saw how a range of new migration corridors opened up, right? Of course, the situation in Syria and elsewhere, you know, was a major factor. And, you know, we saw how these different corridors then um, 
sort of emerged in the sort of political turmoil in the Middle East and North Africa. And we saw increased movements in particular along three major routes. And I will just highlight each of them. And I will go from um, west to east. So I will start here with the Western route, especially from uh, West Africa and Morocco to Spain, right? Actually, these are more or less two routes, one to these small Spanish islands, you know, the Canaries that you see on the bottom left hand, and then uh, migration movements from Northern Morocco and sometimes also from Algeria towards Spain. So we call it the sort of Western uh, route between um, Africa and West Africa, Morocco and Spain. And here, you know, the movements increased, especially in the 1990s, and they peaked in 2006, especially to the Canaries. And we saw how the EU border agency Frontex intervened together with Spanish forces to prevent boats from reaching the islands, right? So we saw again in this context already how the European border was enforced, you know, hundreds of miles away and in co collaboration with uh, between Spanish and EU uh, actors, but also in collaboration with several of the Western uh, African governments. Then over the last few years until 2017 or so, crossings uh, went down quite a bit. And then they increased again over the last years, peaking in 2018 with about 60,000 people arriving. And also in this area, especially uh, along the Canary route, you know, many people die without ever being accounted for. Um, in this area in particular, people, you know, have no means to contact anyone and quite often they are sort of drawn out into the Atlantic and then they're not heard of again. The second route is the central Mediterranean route, which in many ways receives, um, especially in Europe, most of the attention. It's the route between Tunisia, Libya and Italy or Malta. And this over the last few years has been the deadliest route. Um, you know, over 20,000 people have died here in the last, or over 18,000 people, sorry, have died here over the last six years alone. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the Arab uprisings in 2011 and afterwards were really crucial in sort of reopening this particular migration corridor. And so, when you think about the numbers of crossings, you know, there were on average about 23,000 people between 1997 and 2010. Then in 2011, they increased to 64,000. And then over the years between 2014 and 2017, you know, over 150,000 people came uh, across this corridor every year. Over the last few years, we have seen a drop in crossings here, uh, mostly because of the new sort of containment practices with the you know, Libyan forces intercepting migrant boats and returning people to the really terrible conditions in Libya. And of course, the Libyan authorities are funded, equipped and trained by the EU and EU member states. The third route, which might be uh, most familiar to you, is the Aegean route between Turkey and Greece. Um, here, sea migration became a real phenomenon when land borders became you know, very much securitized. Um, and of course, as you know, in 2015 and 2016, you know, uh, Mediterranean migration really peaked with about 1 million people reaching the Greek islands. And this moment has prompted what some have called the sort of so-called migration crisis, right? Um, and maybe you can discuss this later, but of course the question that many have not raised is, you know, whose crisis is this really when 
people cross the sea? You know, is this a crisis for Europe, or are these not actually uh, syn uh, you know, synonymous with crisis in the lives of those who are actually escaping? And um, when so many people cross the Aegean uh, Sea, uh, the EU agreed a new deal with Turkey in March 2016. Uh, the so-called EU-Turkey deal. Um, and after this deal was done, Turkish interceptions of migrant boats increased dramatically, you know, similar to this agreement with the Libyan authorities, also in the Aegean Sea, this sort of interception regime was created so that, you know, a third uh, country would do sort of Europe's border control for Europe. And at the same time, what we have seen happen over the last few years in particular are really violent pushback operations by the Greek Coast Guards. And you know, I'm sure you have seen some of these images where people are left in distress uh, at sea, um, where they are placed on these sort of orange tents um, uh, so that you know, Turkish uh, Coast Guards have to go and, and rescue them. Um, due to these really restrictive migration policies and all the violence that we have seen over the last months, uh, we have seen a real decrease in crossings here. So in 2020, fewer than 10,000 people arrived via the sea to the um, Aegean Islands. Sorry. Okay, um, so this very sort of brief history of Mediterranean migration, I think, shows that there is really nothing natural or sort of normal about the process of migrating across the sea. And there's also nothing sort of natural about people dying at sea, right? And I think one of the questions that we have to raise is, you know, why are so many people dying in the Mediterranean Sea, not least? as this is a really well-monitored space, right? Although quite often it is portrayed as sort of an empty space, you know, a vast space where it's very difficult to find people who go missing. Actually, it is not. It is a highly monitored space. The issue here is, and I want to just give you one case, is that even if migrant boats are known, it does not mean that they are being rescued, right? Rescue is often not launched, um, especially not immediately when it is clear that those who are on these boats are migrants, right? I just want to give you a case of this boat uh, that you see on this slide. It was from three weeks ago only. And I think it highlights many of the reasons why so many people continue to die while they are trying to survive the sea crossing. Okay, so this picture was taken by um, humanitarian rescuers on board the SOS Mediterranee, which is a, a French rescue NGO that operates off the coast of Libya. And they went out to sea a couple of um, weeks ago, expecting that now with you know, better improving weather conditions, more people would try the crossing. And on the 21st of April, so not even three weeks ago, approximately 130 people uh, went onto this rubber boat and left uh, the coast of Libya in the area of Al Khums, uh, trying to reach Europe. When they were out at sea, the people on this board, they contacted the Alarm for Network, and I will speak about this a little bit more later, who relayed their GPS position to European authorities and the public. Right. The Italian Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, which is uh, this sort of authority that is responsible for taking up distress calls in the Mediterranean Sea on behalf of Italy. So the Italian authorities rejected all requests to send out rescue, and they pointed instead to the you know, competent authorities in Libya, 
At the same time, the Italian uh, Coast Guard was aware that the Libyan authorities could not intervene in this instance. Um, you know, they said that the weather was too bad for them to go out, uh, which sounds a bit more like a lie than anything else. At the same time, the, uh, this boat was found by the EU border agency Frontex, uh, who had sent an airplane to locate this boat. So the Frontex aircraft was circling above this boat uh, for a couple of hours and then left again. You know, the alarm phone activists were in constant contact with this boat, knew that you know, the people might not survive the night. Uh, just because the situation was really dire on boat, on the boat, uh, people were in panic. Um, you know, they were not able to move on, and so their boat was just uh, drifting. And so, you know, the alarm from tried to really mobilize help, but none of the authorities, you know, neither Italy, neither Malta, nor Frontex, or the uh, Libyan authorities, uh, said that they would intervene. Right, And so the only ones who actually went to find this boat were non-state actors, right? So we had three merchant vessels and the NGO SOS Mediterranean who tried to find this boat. They searched for a couple of hours, but they came too late and they could only find this uh, rubber boat as well as several uh, corpses. After this shipwreck, you know, different authorities in Europe reacted to the sort of allegations that the people were, were left to die. So the uh, spokesperson for the European Commission said that you know, they could not comment on the shipwreck because they didn't have any competence or influence, regardless of the fact that you know, a Frontex aircraft had uh, found the boat. A spokesperson from Frontex said, you know, they did exactly what they had to do because they alerted national rescue centers. And then these different national rescue centers, including in Italy and Malta, said, well, it was not their area of responsibility because it was the Libyan area of responsibility. And the Libyans said the weather was too bad. We couldn't go out and rescue them. Right. So you see the sort of chain of irresponsibility, right, where every actor is sort of trying to pass on blame to another, right? And in the end, it sounds like it was due to the weather that these uh, 130 lives were lost. But of course, you know, this is not the case. You know, we have to think about the sort of political processes, the policies and so on, that first give rise to the phenomenon of migra uh, sea migration, and then also the particular actions or inactions that prompt these migrant boats to capsize and to not be rescued. After this shipwreck from three weeks ago, I found a newspaper headline which said that death at sea highlights failings in European migration policy. And you know, I thought it was an interesting framing because if migrant death highlighted these failings in migration policy, then clearly you know, the mass dying over the last decades indicates that European migration policy has been and continues to be a complete failure, right? But I think we can look at it also differently, right? So when so many people drown and the factors that give rise to migrant death are known, but exactly the same policies are implemented again and again, I think we cannot really speak about failing migration policies, but we can speak about them actually working, right, as they intended to, right, because they are based on the rationale of deterrence, right. So we could see this one shipwreck that occurred a couple of weeks ago, not as a failure of European migration policy, but an inevitable effect or consequence of this policy. Right. So more than anything else, it highlights policy consistency. Um, and I mentioned this horrible case here because I think it demonstrates quite clearly how you know, the continuously sort of harmful and deadly consequences of 
a deterrence-based um, policy making, you know, what they actually lead to. Um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, in the case of Libya, we can see how a lot of funding, a lot of uh, resources are transferred to Libyan authorities um, so that they intercept migrant boats, while nothing is done to you know, protect the sort of human rights of those who are trying to cross, right? And as a result, we have this sort of vacuum being created at sea where all, uh, all authorities can reject responsibility and um, while the only ones trying to do something about it, you know, NGOs and activists are often uh, blocked out or criminalized. And so, you know, when I hear that, and this is quite often one of these arguments, right, also made by people who are really upset about all this dying in the Mediterranean Sea, it is to say that, you know, Europe is too passive, right? Europe should be more active to prevent the loss of life. But then I think, you know, it's better to say that actually, you know, Europe is a very active actor, right? Death at sea is the consequence of a particular deterrence-based migration policies, which first and foremost has the aim to limit the arrival of migrants in Europe. And you know, these uh, policies set the structural conditions for maritime migration to happen in the first place, right? So we have to think more in terms of the structural forms of violence that are inscribed in these larger systems of migration control, right? We can think about the visa regime, for example, which means that so many people on this planet cannot travel um, across uh, state borders especially not to countries of the global north. And we have to also think about these sort of um, bilateral agreements and other policies, which I've mentioned before, which lead to sea migration in the first place. Right? And then we have to think more in a nuanced way about how a system of um, irresponsibility is created that allows for these sort of shipwrecks to happen. And so over the last uh, five years or so, you know, since 2015, so many people crossed from Turkey to Greece and then tried to reach Germany or Sweden or other countries. You know, we've really seen how the European border is becoming increasingly militarized, right? Um, so we see how um, a system is being created that tries to deflect from European actions by you know, blaming others, including um, countries in Northern Africa, the Turkish Coast Guards, the Turkish government, you know, they tend to blame smuggling and trafficking networks. And they also tend to blame the migrants themselves, right, for putting themselves into these dangerous situations. So I think at the same time, you know, while this is a very um, difficult topic and, you know, we see how so many people continue to lose their lives, I think it's always important to see it firstly as a politically manufactured issue, which can also be responded to with political action, right? And so we see how many non-state actors have gone into the Mediterranean Sea to rescue lives and to also document human rights violations. And so we have to think about the situation in the Mediterranean Sea more as a sort of political struggle, right, that plays out in this really particular space. Um, and we see how migration policies result in ever more lengthy, costly and dangerous journeys, right? But at the same time, and I think this is really crucial to emphasize, is that these movements across the sea are not only a sort of reaction to restrictive policies, but they are also a, uh, they highlight also how people on the move, you know, want to move. They want to cross and arrive at a place of safety, right? And so I think, you know, instead of thinking of migrants and people who are crossing the sea as always victims, 
we have to portray them or think about them slightly different, right? As actually those who enact the right to move in the world. Uh, sorry, this is another image um, that shows these interceptions of migrants um, to Libya, which are often guided by European aerial um, assets. And this was also from last week where a shipwreck occurred and uh, some survivors were returned to Libya. And um, so when we think about sea migration, you know, migrants crossing the sea are often portrayed as these, you know, very sort of sim uh, passive victims that are devoid of any agency, right? But, you know, from both my research, but also my sort of practical engagement, I can say that, you know, it's really far from the truth. Many people who get onto these flimsy boats, um, you know, have a much longer history of migration, right? They have already crossed uh, so many borders before quite often to even reach, you know, the coast of Northern Africa and Turkey. So they've already shown incredible sort of tenacity to have made it that far and to not have succumbed to the many dangers along the way. And also when people are at sea, you know, they don't just sit there and wait to be rescued in a sense, right? But they struggle they try to struggle across borders and escape from um, the authorities and actors that are trying to capture them, right? And many of these boats are not driven by smugglers, although it's often portrayed as such, but by migrants themselves, right? And so we see how now in Greece, you know, migrants who've steered a boat and arrived are sentenced to 30, 40 years in prison, you know, because the authorities want to turn them into smugglers, right? Which they are not. They're just people who are trying to cross and who are able to steer the boat. So I think, you know, we have to also see the agency of those who are crossing and not only, you know, this portrayal of them as passive victim, because then we also see it as a sort of a battle, right, between European forces trying to prevent them from reaching uh, European space and them trying, you know, in many, with many different strategies and tools to get around these borders and subvert them. And so in this space of struggle, you know, we see how so many different actors come together and in, in very conflictual ways, right? And one of these actors is the Alarm Phone Network, uh, of which I'm also a member, which has tried to support people in the Mediterranean Sea. And maybe you've heard about it because um, also it has reached a lot of people in Turkey or in the Aegean Sea who are trying to cross the uh, Aegean Sea. And we are running this network now for ne nearly seven years um, to sort of prevent deaths at sea and to pressurize state authorities in going out to uh, conduct rescues, right? So when we receive calls from the sea, you know, we ask them a range of questions. And the most important question is often, you know, what is your GPS position, right? When have you left? Where are you uh, moving to? But then we also ask, you know, about the situation on these boats, um, you know, whether um, they have reached out to any other authorities, whether they can see any boats or aircrafts nearby, uh, you know, what the medical condition are, it, it, uh, medical conditions are on board, um, on the boats, whether they have any water on board you know, what the condition of the sea is, whether the waves are high and so on. And when we receive the GPS position, we try to you know, localize them and alert authorities and NGOs to where they are. And quite often, as in the case of the shipwreck I mentioned before, but, you know, it's a structural phenomenon, we have to try to pressurize authorities for hours and sometimes to days to even go out and search for these boats, right? And so we try to stay in constant contact with these boats until they have reached safety, but quite often, you know, contact is lost and 
uh, you know, we don't know what has happened to the people. Sometimes we only hear afterwards from the media, or from some other NGOs, you know, what has happened to them. And sometimes also we never find out until maybe some relatives contact us to ask about, you know, where their family members are. And so, you know, I say this also because you know, what happens at sea is very tragic, but at the same time, we also see new forms of solidarity emerge, right? Over the last five years, we have seen so many activists and NGOs going to sea to really change the way in which Europe gets away with all these uh, deaths in the Mediterranean Sea, right? And for me also, you know, it's important to think about these struggles as, you know, political struggles that involve a lot of positive moments even, right? So when boats are lost but are found after days or when, you know, we can pressurize the Coast Guards to move out and rescue, when we receive, you know, people crossing and celebrating their arrival and so on, you know, these are also important sort of political moments of struggle, which are often not um, transported by the media, right? Um, and here a couple of um, images of uh, friends of ours from the NGO Mediterranea being able to rescue a boat that has called the alarm phone um, from the off the coast of Libya. We also have, you know, the boat that was funded by. Banksy uh, intervened in the Mediterranean last year. Um, and we even have friends who are operating sort of aerial surveillance operations on the one hand to monitor what's going on and to find migrant boats, but on the other hand also to um, sort of monitor what European uh, border forces are doing. So I don't want to speak for much longer. Um, but just to conclude that, you know, when we look at Mediterranean migration, you know, we have to think about its history. You know, why does it happen in the first place, right? What are the structural and direct forms of violence that are implicated in the sort of mass dying here? We have to move the discourse away from seeing it only as a sort of humanitarian disaster to seeing it as something that is the outcome of political decision-making and migration policies, right? And I think lastly, and this is something I guess we can discuss more, we cannot really understand precarious migration across the sea and death at sea without also thinking about, you know, other big issues that are ongoing in the world today, right? Wars and conflicts, forms of persecution, racism, white supremacy, economic inequality, environmental degradation and so on. So I think, you know, just to conclude now, the history of migration in the Mediterranean has shown that these policies, you know, often in, um, seeking to stop migration from happening um, have not achieved that, right? But they have prompted a lot of suffering and death, but also despite this sort of violence, you know, Mediterranean migration continues in many ways and new migration corridors are being created by those who are on the move. Okay, I think I just leave it at that so that we have enough time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maurice. That was really, really fabulous. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, maybe you can just turn off your microphone and ask a question directly. I sorry. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, really, it was productive for me. And uh, I have a question, but I know it is not easy to answer. Um, I'm just curious about your opinion. Uh, in the in different parts of the world, uh, wars continue and will continue. And that's why immigration will never stop. Um, so uh, should immigration activists or immigration agencies uh, change their rhetoric? Um, for example, is the demand for the abolition of the borders utopian? Uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> As you know, uh, critical migration lit literature criticized borders, biometrics, dot, the data retrieval. Um, it comes from a Marxist perspective. Um, I'm just asking uh, for discussion. Uh, what can be done to 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 end the tragedy at the borders? Thank you. I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> I think, um, you know, there are so many different levels at which I think, you know, change is needed, right? From uh, changing the discourse around migration, right? To changing migration policies and practices, right? So, I mean, over the last years, you know, especially like in the European context, you know, we have seen how the discourse, you know, from in some ways a welcoming perspective, especially in 2015, 2016, has really moved towards a, a sort of a racist discourse that portrays migrants as, you know, all the things that we know, you know, as, as they're being portrayed, right? As invaders, as those who are taking things away rather than contributing, right? So on this discursive level, I think, you know, we have already a sort of battle at hand and it's really difficult to change these narratives and these sens sensationalized narratives um, and I think you know especially the current condition with COVID has not really um, allowed us to change that right because in some ways I feel that it has uh, placed the focus much more on sort of the national uh, frame um, and you know it's difficult to think about migration, especially unauthorized migration in these times where we think of states again as these sort of uh, containers that have the right to deter people who seek uh, safety and protection, right? So I think uh, at first, you know, we need to challenge the ways in which, you know, migrants are often being portrayed, um, you know, in this very reductive way, you know, where people think they know who migrants are simply from, you know, all this sort of uh, portrayals of them in the media and public discourse. Then I think, you know, what is really crucial is to rethink um, how, you know, some are, of course, incredibly privileged to travel while others are not, right? So why is this sort of uh, global system of uh, segregation allowed to continue in the way it does, given that, you know, uh, you know, to 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 sort of reinforce the the privilege of a few, select few in some ways, right? While maintaining a system of segregation that disallows many from traveling in the first place and then also from fleeing, right? Um, and so I think, you know, there are a lot of really good sort of post-colonial, decolonial perspectives that put the sort of migration regime and especially the sort of global north, global south inequalities into a larger perspective. Um, and then maybe as one more aspect or one more point, I would say that, you know, we have to rethink the border in some ways, right? And I mentioned again that COVID has been quite counterproductive because you know we are we seem to all be in our sort of little national containers um, but i think we have to rethink how borders actually function right because in the traditional imagination and when you read especially international relations scholars um, you know we have come to see the border as just a line right as a sort of geographical limit where nothing is really happening that much and it's just a line that separates one country to the next, right? But when we look at how borders are actually operating today, we see that they are not just territorial edges, right? As you said, you know, they are also biometric systems, right? The border is also um, sort of projected onto someone's skin, right? If they are people of color in particular in the global north context. And we see how the border is also shifted, right? It's shifted from, say, Germany, uh, you know, the outskirts of sort of Germany, where there's this nominal sovereign space, to the center of Africa in some ways, right? 
So we see how borders within the continent of Africa are hardening because of decisions made in Berlin and in Brussels, right? So I think, you know, we have to really recontextualize what it means to migrate when borders are now also migrating in some ways, right? Borders are already um, sort of European borders are, you know, placed into the African context. And I'm always reminded of something that, you know, a friend of mine told me who's working with um, activists in Niger, you know, in uh, Central Africa, who said, well, you know, one of the sort of saddest thing is that, um, you know, the right in Germany, because it's such a powerful country, not just within Germany, but also in the EU, you know, right-wing citizens can impact, you know, the ways in which uh, people in Africa migrate within Africa, right? And, you know, I thought it was a really uh, important sort of thought, right? To think, well, actually decisions made here, you know, they have ramifications so far away that, you know, we have to really rethink the ways in which we conceive of nation states and, um, you know, how they interact and how powerful countries uh, are able to influence migration really far away, if that makes any sense. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Ben bir yeah. soru sormak istiyorum. Teşekkürler sunum için. I would like to ask a question. Thank you very much for your presentation. You are also included alarm med alarm. You refer that call to a, the authority, to the state, and if that state or the authority make an intervention upon your call, is it possible for you to follow up the upcoming process with regard to those uh, migrants? Could you get any data about what will happen next? Is someone translating? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Ahmed Bey is translating. Uh, Maurice, in your interpretation, did you select English? If you go to interpretation, oh, and if you click on it, there is English. Where? Do you see? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right next to reactions, interpretation, and then if you select English, yeah. when the question is Turkish, you will hear the um, English translation. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay, so I'm just a, okay. Could you hear now? Just a question. If I kind of quickly summarize um, Emine's question, she was asking after you. I, I can't hear you, Faisy. Could you hear me now? Could you hear the interpretation now? No, it was very quiet, so I couldn't. Can you hear now, Maurice? Could you hear me? Yes, no. Yeah. Could you hear the interpretation? Daisy, I think we can't hear you. No, your sound uh, Maurice, is not loud. I think you can you hear Ahmed, me, right? Ahmed, yeah. I can hear the translator. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Uh, okay, let me rephrase and re, uh, retranslate the question. The question is that uh, your institution or your organization, uh, that Med Alarm, is a network and you receive calls from the refugees, from the migrants about their situation in Mediterranean Sea. And uh, right after that, for example, you refer the state authorities or international organizations to make an intervention on that refugee boat. What about uh, later than that? Could you get information about what happened to them later on? Or could you uh, get any data about uh, the course of uh, their migration journey? Thanks for the translation and the question. Um, yes, so we, uh, the alarm phone, um, you know, tries to support the people when they are under stress at sea and, you know, tries to accompany them until they reach a place of safety, right? So if they leave from, you know, the Turkish coast to reach Lesbos, you know, 
we try to keep in touch also after they have arrived if possible, right? But quite often, you know, the contact um, disappears or breaks down in a way. Um, it's easier to remain in contact with people when they reach Greece because they quite often call us via WhatsApp and then we have the number. But when they call us from Libya, for example, they have to use a satellite phone. And usually, you know, when they are being rescued, the satellite phone is thrown into the sea um, because people know that European authorities are trying to locate the smugglers, right? And although everyone on these boats are migrants and refugees, uh, you know, they know that they are being criminalized if they hold this phone in their hands when they are being rescued, right? So quite often they throw away the phone and then there's no way that we can reconnect with them, right? Sometimes, you know, we are able to uh, reconnect, you know, and we have, because we have supported so many different boats, you know, sometimes people have gotten in touch afterwards when they reached Germany or Sweden or the Netherlands. And, you know, I've also visited some people who've called us um, from these boats when they were, when they had left Turkey. Uh, there was a Syrian woman, for example, who I visited in uh, West Germany. Um, you know, she had crossed the sea, then she had, you know, gone to Hungary, then she had walked to Germany. And it was quite amazing to, to see her then in somewhere in Germany, right? And it was also funny because she didn't know what the alarm phone was. And it was just that when they were sort of at sea and panicking, you know, a person next to her had written the alarm phone number on his arm. And so like she called us in this way. So, you know, sometimes it's really nice to, to be able to get in touch, stay in touch, to also see you know, how they move on, right? Because of course the sea journey is just one small part of migration journeys. Esma, you had a question I think before. Did you want to ask now? Evet. Um... Indeed, with regard to border security, if someone is accused of accused of making a violation, a border violation or trespassing, for trespassing, for example, there is a German captain who saved refugees, African refugees. But later on, he was accused of committing such an aid, such an assistance to the African refugees, and he was about to be sentenced to imprisonment. So what do you think about it? Is that intervention of him? Did it have an influence over Europe? Because if I had been a captain just like him, I would have done the same thing when you take human rights dimension of the issue into account. And did it have a positive influence in Europe, his uh, courage, so to say? Thank you for the question. Yes, so we've seen how many captains are being criminalized for their actions, right? So we see this, you know, there were several German captains, but also others, um, you know, who were put to prison, or at least they are threatened with uh, prison sentences for their work, right? And so I think this has influenced how we, how many in the uh, public look at uh, what the NGOs are doing, right? Because the authorities are really trying to turn it into a sort of criminal practice, right? To rescue people in distress at sea. And we have seen, you know, so many attempts to um, block NGOs from going out, but also to go after individuals that are involved in these um, activist or humanitarian networks, right? So there's a real sort of strategy of criminalization. And what's so interesting is that when we look at 
the outcome of many of these criminal proceedings, you know, none of these captains had actually actually had to go to jail, right? And so, you know, while it's always proven afterwards that, you know, they have not done anything wrong, actually, they've done every, everything right, you know, they have lived up to the law of the sea, they've lived up to uh, UN conventions on human rights and so on. You know, the aim of these uh, attempts to put them into prison is to stop them from rescuing, right? It's not necessarily to um, you know, put everyone behind jail, uh, into jail, but it is more to uh, cause fear among those who are rescuing, right? And to also prevent them from going out to rescue again. And maybe you've heard, right, in the media, um, but also elsewhere, you know, there are always these accounts of how NGOs are, NGO boats are blocked, right? They have to stay in the harbor for four or five months. And quite often, this is the result of investigations that often lead to nowhere, but they, but that's the project, right? That's the aim. They try to keep NGOs out from um, going back to rescue. Um, and so, you know, instead of warfare, quite often we use the term lawfare, right? How the law being used to uh, prevent these rescues. Another consequence is um, that a lot of captains decide not to rescue, right? So especially from larger merchant vessels, um, you know, they are trying to evade migrant boats um, simply because they know that if they have to rescue them, you know, they either return them to Libya, for example, this would also be a human rights violation, right? And they could actually be charged for that, or they try to bring them to Europe, but then they would also be either blocked and they couldn't enter a harbor, or they would be personally criminalized, right? And so a system is being created that really tries to disincentivize anyone from rescuing. Right. And so unfortunately, over the last years, you know, we have seen how this strategy has been more and more effective. Right. Yeah. Super, thank you. Are there more questions? I can't see everybody on the screen here. I mean, Maurice, maybe I can just ask you, I don't know if you want to just on following up on that to speak a little bit about, um, you know, what's being done to try to create safe ports and, you know, sort of linking ports to sanctuary cities. I mean, I know you can't get into the whole sanctuary solidarity cities, but maybe just in terms of rethinking about how, you know, there's the, the solidarity at sea, but then also at the ports to try to create sort of like an under... I don't know if you would link it to like an underground railway about the passage of people safely. Yes, thanks, Kim. Um, so, you know, we've seen all these interventions by NGOs and activists at sea, but, you know, we have seen also how many different groups are trying to challenge, you know, this really unwelcoming uh, system in Europe, right? So, um, I think, you know, we have seen, especially since 2015, how both state governments in Europe, but also the EU institutions have sort of come to the conclusion that they want to deter migrants as much as they can, right? Uh, on the other hand, we have also seen how solidarity networks have emerged from the ground up, right, from the bottom up. Um, so we have seen different networks, you know, migrant groups, activist networks, um, NGOs, humanitarian actors, but also, you know, politicians on the local level, you know, local uh, cities, municipalities, and so on, they are trying to create something else, right, that are trying to live up to the idea of, you know, human rights, uh, safe sp spaces, sanctuary, and so on, and they have you know, try to build, you know, uh, cities of welcome and open their harbors. 
And so, you know, I've been also part of a process or a project that has spoken with different mayors in Europe um, to try to convince them to work together to keep the harbors open, right? So we've seen, um, for example, the mayor of Palermo, uh, Orlando is his name, um, welcoming people to his city who've arrived by the sea. And we have seen mayors in, in Spain and in, in many different small cities also in Germany who say, well, actually, you know, we want to welcome people who are, you know, trying to cross uh, to Europe. Um, and, you know, we want to have people relocated from the camp in Lesbos, for example, to a city in Germany, right? So there is the attempt to create these new forms or other forms of solidarity um, from the ground up. I think, you know, it's really difficult. It has become really difficult, I think, to do that because, you know, as I said earlier, also the COVID crisis is being used against that, right? To prevent people from crossing, to obviously also prevent people from meeting, you know, when they are uh, trying to building up uh, to build up networks in support of uh, migrants and refugees. But I think, you know, it's still important to, to continue with that because, as I said, there is this sort of agreement on the other political levels that, you know, the border securitization process is sort of inevitable, right? There's no other solution to that. There's no other sort of imaginary about what to do with the issue of migration, right? And then at least, you know, there are these other actors that create, you know, open up the way in which we can think about migration and solidarity and you know, how we should sort of live together in a city um, and all these things, right? And so for me, looking at, you know, what is being produced, even in these very local spaces is really, is really crucial, right? And I think also in Turkey, you know, there are many groups that are, you know, trying to uh, create these spaces of welcome, right? And I mean, obviously, I'm speaking to you here also because it's one of these spaces, right? And for I think us, it's also important to move this away from this very Eurocentric context, right? Where it's always the idea that you know Europe or European citizens are welcoming, um, you know, people from the global south. And, and to put it into a more of a transnational or international um, discourse, right? So we also work with people in Northern Africa, in Tunisia, in, uh, in Morocco, as well as in Senegal and elsewhere, who are really trying to, you know, build communities of solidarity wherever they are, right? And it's not only about sort of Europeans welcoming others into their communities, right? But so it's a completely different way of thinking about, you know, how societies could be organized and you know how it's uh, how it's also um going against the the way in which currently you know borders are used to to separate uh, communities thanks maurice other questions um hi can you hear me Go ahead, Zainab. Yes, okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, and I have a, both a commentary and a point for discussion uh, for Morris uh, particularly, but I uh, also other people might uh, say their views. Um, I was wondering about your view um, relating the, uh, the, the shipwreck, you know, uh, that uh, took place near Libya borders uh, in um, and all, like oh, around 800 people died. And then uh, in the Venice Biennale, uh, the, the ship was, you know, Barca Nostra, if I'm pronouncing it, and uh, it was uh, put on show uh, in the Biennale. And uh, there were lots of discussions, you know, whether it's, uh, right to do so i mean thinking about the uh, how the refugees might feel and jean francois perus for instance who is working about the borders that borders uh, that's at the borders and uh, 
a migrant uh, refugees situation also criticized this, you know, uh, saying that we should uh, we should at least uh, ask uh, ourselves, you know, how this might uh, make the refugees who survived these terrible incidents might feel when they see it. Uh, whether it's empowering to show uh, these um, boats, you know, in uh, Vienna's or other uh, platforms, like uh, as an empowering artistic practice, or whether it is uh, on the contrary. I mean, what's your view? Uh, because you are uh, so active in the field also. I wondered, uh, what do you think about it? Thank you very much. Thanks, that is a very good question. And I think, yes, I'm happy to hear also other uh, comments on that. Um, I mean, I find it awful, to be honest. I find it really uh, dehumanizing in many ways, you know, how a shipwreck is used to reinforce this sort of spectacle around migration, right? So um, we see how it's not only done by these artists at the Biennale, but, you know, that this ship was uncovered from the sea was also a political stunt, right? It was, you know, done by the Italian authorities after these hundreds of people drowned. And, you know, they're actually in this shipwreck, over a thousand, a thousand people are said to have drowned and there were only 28 survivors. And the issue, you know, so like it's completely decontextualized why these people were on the boat, um, you know, and why this boat actually capsized. And it was interesting to look at this case from 2015, and it was actually, uh, it actually sank during a rescue operation. So there was a merchant vessel that was trying to rescue these people and there was a collision and then this boat uh, capsized, right? And, you know, we have to firstly ask, obviously, why were so many people on this boat in the first place? Why couldn't they cross via more sa like safer migration channels, right? But then we also have to ask, you know, why did this collision happen in the first place, right? Why was a merchant vessel sent to them instead of uh, Coast Guard vessels, right? Because the problem is with merchant vessels that they are really not equipped to rescue people, right? They are, if you look at merchant vessels, you know, they are gigantic and they have small crew or crews that are not trained to rescue people, right? And so this crew was totally overwhelmed and, you know, they, they collided with this boat and obviously it was, a sort of unfortunate tragedy in this moment, but we have to contextualize this boat in much larger political decision-making processes, right? And for me, that's one aspect. And then afterwards, uh, you know, the Italian government tried to really use this shipwreck again to um, sort of, you know, to, to turn it into this sort of humanitarian spectacle while at the same time trying everything they could to keep people away, right? To uh, give uh, the Libyans, you know, speedboats to create, you know, give funding uh, so that they can intercept ever more migrants, right? So I'm, uh, you know, really critical of the ways in which these particular shipwrecks are being used and they are sort of singled out as a, um, you know, a particular instance when, of course, the issues are of much larger and sort of structural dimension, you know, but, and I mean, obviously also, you know, it being shown in the Biennale with people drinking champagne next to it, you know, feels quite disturbing in some ways. So I'm definitely not a fan of that, that uh, stunt. But, you know, I'm interested in, in other comments as well, because, you know, some say, well, actually it allows others to get a sense of a migrant boat that capsized and maybe it leads to some sort of you know processes of of of, of thought i guess <laughs> but i'm not too convinced does anybody else want to to comment it reminds me also of the situation of ai Weiwei and some of his artwork that was using the death of Alan Kurdi, who died off the coast of Turkey as well, right? And some of the artwork that's been done around the, the life jackets, but then also himself on the sand, um, imitating Alan Kurdi and some of the debates around that, about whether that was effective or not. 
No takers. <laughs> Any other questions? Maurice, can I ask you maybe then one other question? Um, I was really happy, you know, you talked about the militarization of the border and I was happy that you kind of also noted this current moment of COVID on the one hand, and then also I think in response to the questions, the criminalization that's happening around people who, who try to assist. And I was just wondering, um, the kind of other aspect of that is the pressures I think that get placed on organizations like yourself. And I'm curious to hear sort of your thoughts about how you navigate this in terms of taking on some of the governance work um, and how you, how you create a free space. So both from being criminalized and having those pressures yourself of rescuing um, and at the same time, governments sort of de facto then hands off and not doing anything because they say, okay, there are, you know, NGOs out there. You're not an NGO by that per se, but I'm saying that, you know, the whole kind of conversation around humanitarian assistance and NGOs and um, assisting, but at the same time, trying to keep themselves relatively independent from some of the, the pressures and taking on some of the governmental work that they might not want to do. Um, I'm not sure in your own case, if if there's that kind of conversation with alarm phone and, and kind of navigating those pressures. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, this is a really uh, important question, right? And so in the beginning, you know, when NGOs first started to send boats to rescue, right? It was 2014, 2015 in particular, you know, there was the idea that they would in some ways replace state-led rescue, right? And there was the concern to say, well, this is being outsourced to civil society, right? So states can just stand back and let NGOs do the sort of heavy lifting, right? Do the um, heavy work. And I think to an extent this is correct, right? We also had, for example, a couple of NGOs that were actively sort of trying to make the case that the state should use them for this, right? Uh, there was one particular NGO called MOAS, which I'm not very, you know, uh, which I'm very skeptical about. It was actually the first NGO in the Mediterranean, and it was founded by a Italian US couple that, you know, was millionaires. They had made their money from uh, an insurance company that they ran, which also uh, protected mercenaries going into war in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? So, they had made a huge fortune and now they wanted to rescue people in the Mediterranean, which is of course a you know, positive step in some ways, but you know, the way in which they um, sort of spoke about their own intervention, it was a lot about, you know, look at the US, you know, when they went to Iraq, they used a lot of sort of mercenaries to do the dirty job, right? So that the government was not responsible for what happened. Why don't we do the same in the Mediterranean where NGOs go and do the rescue and it doesn't fall back to European states, right? And so, of course, this is a very problematic uh, narrative. Um, and they have also left the Mediterranean many years ago. Uh, but since we have seen mostly NGOs who are you know, very critical of Europe, of you know, European migration policies, and who the, see themselves not as sort of actors to which this work is being outsourced, but rather as you know, activists and humanitarians who need to go to this space because otherwise, first, nobody actually does it. And second, you know, they will counter monitor the scene, right? They want to reveal what Europe is trying to hide. And so I see it much more now in, through this perspective, right? And I think all the different attempts to criminalize NGOs speaks to that, right? I mean, if Europe was happy and just handing over responsibility to NGOs, you know, they wouldn't criminalize all of them, right? And so I think, you know, these actions are so important uh, precisely because there's so much pushback from EU governments, right? Um, it highlights exactly why this uh, humanitarian engagement and activism is needed. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, many also of my, you know, friends and in other NGOs, you know, they have been criminalized, right? They had to 
face you know fines or they had to go to court proceedings and as, as i said earlier none of them were ever really prosecuted like uh, put to jail right they never had to um you know they were never sentenced but quite often you know when you are under investigation of course you don't you can't really continue right in your engagement and this has been the effect of this right it has meant that a lot of uh, people withdrew, you know, they were also becoming too scared, right? Because it is scary when the sort of the state apparatus is going against you, right? Um, and so they have tried to uh, sort of leave this chapter behind. And of course, you know, this weakens a movement. And I think this is one of the biggest uh, concerns here, right? That it is possible to weaken movements by using you know the law in some in many ways to uh, to intimidate uh, activists yeah but at the same time you know also this criminalization has been going on now at least for three four years but ngos are always returning right they are dealing with it in, in many creative ways as well um but it remains a, a huge concern yeah thanks maurice I know that we're running out of time, but Nicole, do you have a, you have a question? Yeah, one more question, maybe. Um, uh, the Legal Center of, of Lesbos has, um, at um, the European Court uh, in Strasbourg, uh, they have, they, I think they have five lawsuits now against the government of Greece uh, concerning the pushbacks of the Greek government. And, um, so that's an NGO who fights back to the government. Um, do you think that will result in anything? Because on a political level, I should just uh, said that uh, maybe we sh should approach it in a more political sense. Do you think that has any, well, maybe a good result? Because um, I think the Minister of Migration uh, of Greece, he says that uh, it's only fake news and they are trying to denialize it uh, as uh, just, well, but there is evidence and I think the lawsuits are real. So uh, what do you, what's your opinion about it? Yeah, I mean, it's really uh, shocking and disturbing, I think, what's happening in the Aegean Sea at the moment, right? Yeah. Um, not just in the Aegean, but also in the Central Mediterranean, of course. But I think what is one of the main problems is that individual member states don't have to feel any pressure anymore from the EU, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, Malta last year, you know, they used um, secret boats to return people to Libya, right? And loads of people have died in the process. And, you know, Alamfa was also part of a lawsuit in Malta against the prime minister who was, you know, facing charges of manslaughter as well as nine members of the military, right? And it completely, this charge completely disappeared, right? There was no interest in really following up on this and you know it was put under the table and the eu just didn't comment on it right the eu institutions mm -hmm. and the same is the case in greece i think where you know pushbacks are like a daily practice right every day we see uh, people being pushed back you know we see how people are threatened with, with like guns you know and quite often the greek coast guards you know they wear masks you know, they look like paramilitaries, right, operating in the, in the Aegean Sea. And, you know, we know this already for years, but especially since the last year, since COVID started, this has become like an everyday situation. And so we've also collected loads of evidence, the Liga Center Lesbos, and, you know, there are also good journalists who have uncovered a lot of this. Um, but yeah, exactly, the Greek government can continue to say, it's fake news because nobody will really challenge them, right? On a sort of political level, like the EU level, for example. Well, well I think the, the European Court in Strasbourg is an international, yeah, uh, recognized institute. So if there is a conviction there, maybe it can be. I don't know if it will be. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid uh, it will not change anything. But no, I mean I'm in support of all of these challenges, and I mean there are loads of challenges, um, and you know I, it does put pressure on some actors, especially on Frontex, right? The EU border agency has come under a lot of 
media pressure because of these pushback practices where Frontex was present. I just think that, you know, there is so little political will, mm -hmm. um, you know, by the, the dominant member states, right? Germany is completely in support of what's happening at the external borders, for example, as is France and other countries that, you know, there might be a legal challenge, but I think the whole practice will not change, right? And no, 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 see, no, I'm afraid yeah. that, you know, you're right there. But yeah, maybe it's a beginning to to start some lawsuits from the from within the NGOs to make a little change. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Start maybe. Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can see that we're um, at time. So, and I know that uh, for many of you, it's dinner time as well. So um, we're getting there slowly. Um, so anyways, I'd like to thank, uh, give us, uh, give a very warm thank you to um, Maurice for, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. That was a really fascinating talk and thank you to everyone for your questions. And um, we'll be continuing with this topic. We have um, Dr. Alison Mounts joining us um, on Thursday and she'll be continuing on with talking about um, deaths at the border and thinking about death of asylum as self uh, coming out of that. So uh, thank you all and uh, we'll see you on Thursday.